Good Morning. This is Faith in Our Hometown, brought to you as a community service of Mercy Hospital Joplin. And now, here's your host, Father Jay Friedel. Good morning, and thank you for joining us again here at Faith in Our Hometown. Uh, at the, at each of us, as we get a little bit older, sometimes have to deal with the issues of uh, getting ill, uh, sometimes dealing with that with our family members. Of course, all of us, whether we like it or not, are going to grow older, and we sometimes have to deal with the issues of aging and the things that happen to us because of that. We know that those impact us as people of faith. They also impact the way that we do uh, our care for our elderly and those in our midst and those who are sick. And so today, we have two guests with us on Faith on Our Hometown. Uh, one is Randy Garris. Uh, Randy is uh, on the staff at Ozark Community College, Ozark Christian College, I'm sorry. And uh, Randy is also a longtime pastor here in the area. Uh, and so he joins us today from a bit of a pastoral perspective. And also with us uh, for the first time here on Faith in Our Hometown is Gary Pulsifer. Gary is the stake president for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints here in our area. And he also happens to be the um, chief operating officer for Mercy. Joplin here in Joplin. So we'll be coming back in a few moments to talk to these gentlemen about uh, what we would call end of life issues. Uh, and as we do so, we're going to be discussing uh, the way that we care for the people that we care about. Um, we hope that perhaps that uh, this will impact you in such a way that you might um, be able to take some care in the way that you might be able to help your elderly prepare, and especially to have some of those great conversations that probably need to happen long ahead of time so that uh, we can do those things in a, in a good way. We'll be right, right after this Mercy Minute. Hi, I'm Angie Saparita with Mercy Hospital. I'm here today with Dr. Anand Afane. Dr. Afane, you are a rheumatologist with Mercy Hospital, is that correct? Yes. What does that mean? What does a rheumatologist do? So rheumatology usually deals with evaluating and treating autoimmune diseases where the body attacks itself. Um, mainly rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, vasculitis, scleroderma. We also treat a lot of joint diseases, joint pain, gout, osteoarthritis, and many other um, autoimmune diseases as well. There's a big need for that in this area, I know. Um, are you accepting patients right now? Yes, we are accepting new patients and we schedule them within a week or so at the moment. And do they need a referral? They do need a referral from their primary care and they can just call our office and we'll get them in as soon as we can. Perfect, perfect. If you want to find out more, you can call the number that's on your screen or you can also visit us at mercy.net. Hi, I'm Father Jay Friedel. Welcome back to Faith in Our Hometown. Again, I'm here with two of our guests uh, this week. Uh, Gary Pulsifer, who is the stake president uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints here in our area, and the chief operating officer for Mercy Hospital Joplin. And also with us is Randy Garris. And Randy is a longtime pastor here in the area. Right now is at Ozark Christian College. And they both join us today. Um, one of the things that we do as pastors, Randy, is uh, to deal with our congregations as they age, as they get older, sometimes they get sick and of course many of them and eventually all of us die. We do have an appointment for that don't we? we yeah, have all yeah. of us. Today I was sitting in a, uh, a therapy center here in the area and as I sat there I couldn't help but notice that some of the most courageous people I've seen in a long time were, were old people in bad health with the courage to fight through what they were fighting through. I, I watched one woman today as she just has lost the ability, the stroke had taken what, what had been so easy for. And I'm not sure that there's not a place to applaud some of the older people in our life that are dealing with the losing of power, the losing of things, and they're saying goodbye to things bit at a time. And so yeah, there's a place for those of us that, that are gonna love people to make sure we step in and root on and cheer uh, for those who are showing that kind of courage. Well, and they, they teach us so much. Uh, you know, I, I, I preached here recently about living in the moment and how most of the lessons that I've learned about living in the moment have come from my members who are dealing with illness or coming to the end of their life or at least they sense that that window is, is starting to close. And they really have taught me a great deal about, you know, 
trying to live uh, just for the present. Those people who are dealing with chronic illness or with terminal illness live in a, in a very different way sometimes than the rest of us who get caught up you know, with what's going to happen next week or next month or six months from now or years from now. And, and they teach us a whole lot about learning to live in the moment. Uh, and it's just a beautiful thing. I mean, I, it's good for my spirituality, you know, dealing with them in those contexts. Many times we turn to people like you, though, Gary, uh, to uh, help us in those moments because, I mean, you, uh, we got two great hospitals here in our community, but you happen to be at Mercy. Uh, and thanks, by the way, for sponsoring the show. But <laughs> now that I've said that, uh, uh, do we need to make a disclosure or something? But at any rate, but now that we, we're there, um, we, we turn some of our loved ones over to you. And, and, and so how do you see the role of a hospital healing institution in a community like ours, uh, both as a man of faith and as a hospital administrator? You know, it's a, it's a blessing to be able to work with those families. I mean, we, we do it every day, you're right. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, it's interesting. You, one might think that the people that take care of people every day would get callous to it. Mm -hmm. But it's like you say, they become more sensitive. They become more, uh, more attuned to the needs of those people that they're taking care of. It's an amazing thing. It's what makes working in a hospital such a blessing. You, you work around wonderful people every day that just give their all. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And we've got all kinds of people of faith there. I mean, you know, sometimes oh. I think people in the area think, you know, uh, you know, everybody that works there is you know, Catholic. Okay, well, it is a Catholic hospital. And yes, we do expect that you guys are going to do things in a Catholic way. That's right. Okay, <laughs> that, that, is, that is an expectation there right. in a Catholic, a Catholic health facility. But, but you yourself, you're not Catholic, That's but right. you've learned how to work in a Catholic health care system. Mm -hmm. So many of your associates, your mercy associates that are there and work for your hospital are not Catholic, but, but they do so with a certain sense of mission and a certain sense of pastoral care. Can you say a little bit about maybe how you know, those, the, the, some of those values are lived out in the Mercy Charism? You know, very early on when we, and we do it right at orientation with every new employee, we take them through what Mercy was founded upon. And that's that we live the principles that Jesus lived. We, we agree, really, to treat people the way Jesus would treat people. Yeah. And uh, to, to not be a disappointment to the Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> that's how I often think of it. Uh, and they would get you. They would. If you, they would. If you, if you, didn't, if you were disappointed, right. they would get you. Because you know? the Sisters of Mercy, I mean, you know, have a long history in our community. I always say to our Catholics, you know, and I, and I think I can say it to everyone, how different would the history of Joplin look if the Sisters of Mercy had not come to Joplin? Because they came, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 1800s, and they made a difference because first they started teaching our kids. Mm -hmm. And then when there was, when the, when the teaching sisters saw that so many of the minors were getting injured, um, and you know, and didn't, and they had to send them to Fort Scott, and they're they're by dying along the way, and that there was no medical care here. That's when the sisters came and decided to open the first hospital, right. you know, to try to take care of the people in the area. So it's just kind of like, I mean. It is a great religious history for us. I mean, and, and as Catholics, I mean, we're just really proud of that whole thing. Uh, we're proud of that history, uh, but the, but but we're grateful to the Sisters of Mercy we are. because they we were are. really the ones that answered the call to come and to care for people. And again, the mission has never just been to care for the Catholics. Oh, it's no. only 4% of the community. If we yeah. only cared for the Catholics, we wouldn't have much work to do. But we try to care for everybody uh, that comes to us. And as you said, as Jesus would do so mm -hmm. if he entered the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a great mark of care for us and for mercy. Um, you know, and, I, and I know that there are other great believers in other institutions oh, as yeah. well, yeah. and not trying to downplay that. But I mean, obviously, there's a little bit of pride there for us in the way that we do Catholic health care. So I'm really glad you're with us this, <laughs> yeah. uh, this morning. Thank you. Um, as we talk about some of these things, so we, we send our folks to you when they are ill. Um, and um, you want to say, you know, they're, they're, some you only keep for a little period of time, some you keep for a longer period of time, some you just really are helping to you know, wrap things up uh, and live comfortably before they die. Mm -hmm. What kind of a mixture uh, of that world is that? You know, Sometimes mercy is just like, oh, acute care, that's all you do. But there's a lot more to it, isn't there? There is a lot more to it. Yeah. And as you think of end of life issues, and there are such tremendous resources that are focused on people at the end of life. And there's so much, you know, most of us fear that day when we're realizing that we're within a few days of our death. And, but there's so many things that can be done and such great services that can be provided for those people to make it comfortable, to make it the very best time you can for their families to be with them. So we get into all sorts of care. But you're right, most of our business, probably 90% of it is the quick in and out treatments of the people that come to us every day for, for short little maladies that they need fixed or to see their physician or to get a test. Some, t some of them get hospitalized, certainly. We sure. deliver a lot of babies. There's a lot of joy in a hospital, too. Oh, yeah. 
And really, I mean, so much of uh, so much of healthcare has shifted in a lot of ways from just caring for chronic, but to, to health. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that's the there's certainly the movements you're trying to make into the whole community in terms of helping people to live well. That's right. Uh, that's rather right. than just dealing with people when they happen to get sick. So how do we keep everybody well at the same time? Randy, you want to approach that as a from a pastoral standpoint as well? I mean, you know, not just the the physical, but we've also got the the spiritual, the emotional. I don't want it to sound like it's um, too bashing of our culture, but I do think there's some things that come together at the end of life issues that sort of accent what our culture is. Uh, I've said through the years that if you live in a third world country, you're going to bury babies. That's what you're going to do. Well, what's the price we paid in the first world country? And that is that you may be um, uh, pretty activity centered and live at arm's length from people. You can't do that at the end of your life. At the end of your life, the craving is, did my life make any difference to anybody else? Uh, it's we they, they wrestle with at the end of their life. Is, is there a we? Is there an us? Is there a community I'm a part of? In the end of life, whenever, from a minister's standpoint, what you're doing is you're trying to bring people into their life if, if they have rejected them earlier, or if they have had people in their life, but they have lived at such a pace that they haven't uh, allowed them to get very deep. You're, you're helping to reconnect people. Now, obviously, people want to know what's going to happen and, and what does God think and what happens when I die. And so Do there's you have clearly a biblical answer for that. Yet? Yeah. Well, there's there's, <laughs> I'm just there's things I'm passionate about, but but what you know what you're doing at the end of life for issues is you're connecting people to one another because when they were healthier, maybe it was a luxury that thought they didn't need, but now now they have to have it. Oh yeah, I always I always just say you know the more we are in control and the more we are healthy and wealthy and wise and all those things, we have much less need for God. Yeah, yeah. But whenever it, yeah. It, there, there's something is called into question in any of those areas, uh, you know, um, it, it really does make our need for God much more acute. And I think we do get to that point where we struggle to figure out, you know, where, where is the sense in all this? And of course, so many of our people who are ill, one of the things we're always aware of is sometimes illness uh, that's when people will start to even separate from God because they think, you know, is God doing this yeah. to me, or um, am I, you know, am I, have I offended God? Is God punishing me? Does God love me anymore? And those are sometimes the issues we get to deal with as, as pastoral ministers. Almost, almost every major issue comes back at a road at the end of life. Mm -hmm. Have I treated people well? Um, have I loved and been loved? And this sense of who's my creator? Uh, am I safe in the hands of my Creator? Uh, what's the Creator have in mind for the future for me? Uh, every big issue comes back in. Yeah. And, uh, and so y the end of life are the best conversations, honestly. <laughs> well, and again, we're much more aware in this day and age, too, of how holistic everything is because we know that as we're dealing with a person's physical health, we're also dealing with their emotional health and with their physical health, uh, I mean, and their spiritual health. I mean, you know, we know that sometimes w uh, something is, um, you know, a, a malady of one is causing the disease in the other part. Uh, and so again, it's that, you know, there's a great uh, emphasis in this day and age to try to look at things holistically and to help people approach uh, their lives and their health holistically, uh, body, mind, spirit. Um, you know, one of the things that I think I want to talk about in the next segment is going to be, you know, how do we set people up to have some of these conversations and what they want done. So, you know, how to advance directives. We need to talk a little bit about that. We also need to uh, talk about those folks as they get to the end and what can we do for some of those folks in our community as uh, they get to the end of life. Uh, so those are going to be some of the things that we want to talk about in this, in this next section. Uh, but uh, I know that uh, it is good to be with you again uh, for uh, folks who have just joined us this morning. Our two guests this morning are Randy Garris, uh, who is a longtime pastor of the area from Ozark Christian College, and uh, Gary Pulsifer, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Mercy. And so uh, we thank you for joining us, and we'll be right back. You're watching Faith in Our Hometown on KSN-TV, brought to you as a community service of Mercy Hospital Joplin. Welcome back to Faith in Our Hometown. 
I'm here with Randy Garris and with Gary Pulsifer. Uh, good to have you both with, uh, with us this morning to have this conversation about end of life issues and what that means for various members of our communities. Um, you know, Gary, you work in the healthcare industry and one of the big things that we know that people need to do ahead of time and to have these conversations ahead of time with their family and their loved ones and those who are, gonna, who are going to be entrusted with making some of those decisions for them are end of life uh, directives. Um, what would you give all of our viewers in terms of your best piece of advice on how to do all that? Well, it is critical that we have those conversations and have them early. We all feel at certain points in our lives that we're a bit immortal, you know, that this isn't going to happen to me. So it's, early, it's important to have those conversations early and to get consensus with the family. Sometimes the biggest challenges we see, and often it's with a family member that's not as connected as they would like to have been, then they just can't allow some of the things that the patient many times would, would love to have happen. Yeah. They can't allow that to happen because the conversations have at least haven't gotten deep enough. Yeah, like for, so for example, sometimes one of the great you know, arguments that we have to have with the family is you know, the person is getting to the point where they can't communicate anymore and they basically said, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, good. I'm ready to go. I'm ready, I'm, okay. I, I'm, I'm tired of fighting. I've fought long enough, it's time for this to happen. And then the person who hasn't been there for a while shows up and says, oh no, 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 we gotta do something else. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sometimes it's the doctor, sometimes it's a minister, sometimes it's you know, whoever is there to say, no, 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 that wasn't their wish. Mm -hmm. And they had it written down. So it's always a protection for the person who really wants whatever want they want done to make sure that they've got it in writing That's and right. to make sure that everyone else knows it because you guys will follow those directives. We will Even follow. if the family member comes in and says, oh, no, no, I don't want that. You know, uh, you know again, uh, those things have to be done ahead of time. And they're very, they're very critical conversations. Um, also, from a pastoral point of view, Randy, I'm sure you've had that whole business about well, the family wanted some, you know this for arrangements, or they wanted you know this kind of a, you know observance made at, uh, in prayer or whatever, and the family comes in and says, oh no no no, we were going to do that somewhere else. Uh, I, I was with one last week. It's, it's actually it dates a little earlier. It has to do with the uh, the end of life issue before the funeral, but but uh, we had they had to call the authorities and the police there because an estranged family member is throwing a fit because what the wishes of the parent um, just were not, the, 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 the adult child didn't want to accept it, didn't want to accept it. I, I would clearly say write things down, write them down, we can fight for you, we will stand beside you. The brokenness that exists in, in extended family members, um, that will get in the way, write it down. If you don't write it down, we're, we're, we're kind of up a creek without a paddle. That's right. Yeah. I had, a, I had a, a situation a few weeks ago where uh, I was so, finally so proud of one of the kids because, you know, mom had died a year before. They did not follow her wishes yeah. and did not bring her to the Catholic Church to bury her, okay? And now dad had died. And the one son just basically said, we did this, we did this against mom's wishes and I'm not doing it again for dad's. Yeah. And finally that I kind of brought all the rest of them around and yeah. they kind of said, oh, okay. And also at the funeral, I just basically thanked them for doing it because, well, and I also said that they were gonna have a whole lot easier time when they got back to be with mom and dad later yeah. on. Absolutely. So they were Abs not gonna Absolutely. be in trouble in the Absolutely. same way that they were gonna be otherwise. Because, you know, those are, and, and again, it, it's, you know, everybody's needs are different. And I know that, that what we were taking care of at that point in time were mom and dad's wants, mom and dad's needs, mom and dad's desires, what they wanted to respect in terms of the way they wanted to go out. And the kids didn't have the same needs. And, and it was okay, they, they yeah. didn't need to have the same needs. I right. didn't need to impose those needs on that, but I wanted to say, but can we at least respect what mom and dad did? So we do that in terms of the church things, we do it in terms of the, the healthcare okay. facility areas, we do that in nursing homes, we do it in hospitals, we do it wherever. But those advanced directors are essential. Let me, let me just kind of pitch in here. Um, David says in the Psalms, you know, this, this prayer, oh Lord, teach us to number our days. Mm -hmm. I don't know that the end of my life needs to be um, tattooed across my eyeballs. I, I don't mean that. But if I don't look at the end of life and think about it, I'm kind of an idiot. And, and so there's a sense in which, as children, we learned you cannot hide the broccoli under the plate. You can't. As much, no matter how much you try, you can't. It's, it's still there. And truth is, no matter, I'm, I'm 61 years old myself. Doesn't matter what age I am, though, I do have a day that my life will come to an end. And if I do not look at that and, and, and have some willingness to talk about it, you know I'm pretty unhealthy. 
I, I mean, who, who, has a, who has an airplane ticket in their pocket <laughs> and would never think the fact that I'm flying out sometime today? All of us have an airplane ticket in our pocket. I mean, all of us are leaving this some terminal time, somewhere yes. along the line. And if you, and if you won't, aren't willing to look at it, something's unhealthy. And when you look at it, write down what you're thinking. Uh, couldn't say it any stronger. Yeah. Well, my whole thing and my whole pitch is to make sure that we're getting everybody to make sure that they're not just living for when that moment occurs, but to live between now and all those moments in between that moment occurs. Because I'm a firm believer in the fact that when Jesus was talking about living in the kingdom, he wasn't just talking about the kingdom that was coming down the road. He was talking about the kingdom that existed yeah. right here and right now as he was in our midst. So we've got a few things that can help us to do that for some of our folks who are in our healthcare facilities, who are, who are coming to the end of that life, or maybe some of those that, know, that don't know that. One of the things I think is one of the greatest things that ever got going on the face of the earth, for example, is the hospice movement, or what we, in some places we now call palliative mm -hmm. care. Um, Gary, you want to talk a little bit about palliative care and what that means and how folks can set those kinds of things up? You know, it's tremendous. When, and you, once, once those decisions have been made, uh, then there's an entire team of people physicians, nurses, and others that swoop in and make certain that that person is treated in just the very best way. They so once a person gets to that point where they say, okay, I, I've done all the medical treatment I can do, mm -hmm. I've taken care of all those things, it, it still seems that my death is inevitable, mm -hmm. now I want to move into a different way of right. approaching it. Right. And that's what you're talking about there in yeah, terms and it's, of and it, uh, that it, team that comes together. It can be some of the most rewarding times for those people and it's for their families. That's the beauty of it is it, it acts in a way to bring families together and to treat them in just wonderful ways. We take care of the pain issues. We make sure that their wishes are met in, in all of the ways. There are wonderful care coordinators and nurses, physical therapists and others who work with those families, yeah. pastoral care people that come in and make sure that their needs are met. And this is done not just in the hospitals, it can also be done in homes. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we've got several hospice programs mm -hmm. around the area. Yeah. I know, uh, you know, Freeman also runs oh, a, you know, a, hospice, yeah. you know, a palliative care, but, but it is, it's a, it's a, it's a different approach. And, and, the, and, and uh, the, the person who originally came up with the approach basically just said there's only one thing that we can't do for that person and that's walk alongside. Right. To be that companion for that person who's doing that. And that gets back to all those things you mm -hmm. were talking about, Randy, in terms of all those issues. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, getting the family together and being able to talk about some of those things. Getting the family together and, and helping them to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. Getting the family together and talking about some of those unresolved issues. Getting the family together to talk about issues of faith that are impacting them all uh, in terms of those things. I don't know how much the culture has actually changed and how much is just the fact that my eyesight changed. <laughs> but when I was a younger guy, I, if I roll back 40 years ago when I sort of started some of this, the amount of dignity that somebody gets in their death now is so much better than what I saw. The, the, sense, the sense of treating them as a human being and little less as a pincushion, a little less of just some of the rigmarole they had to go through. I think the last 40 years, I think most people, if, if you get a caring uh, medical community around you, the hospice around you, um, let them coach your family and some of these things, I think you get to die with much greater dignity and much greater sense of humanity uh, being present. We've made progress there. Yeah, you know, and I guess I don't, you're just this much older than I am, okay? okay. But I, I guess I don't, I, I guess I've been blessed okay. that I've always seen some of that happening. Um, and it's one of the reasons why, it's that dignity of the human person that really matters. It's one of the things, again, our principles, uh, you know, and the way we address that is that that dignity is there by virtue of not that person, but it's, it's, it's someplace bigger. It's a bigger part of the mystery, that, that, that dignity of every human being. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, we'll help a person to die with dignity, but we won't ever hasten a person's death. Okay, right. you know? I agree with that. You know, we, yeah. we, that's why we care for them while they're dying, but we don't push them over the edge. Right. Um, you know, because that, that is something that is, that is unique to them and it is unique to their process and the process of how they live and how they die. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and helping people to do that. So I, I, I was fortunate, I guess I'm blessed to, that I, I've always, always known that sense of the, of the dignity of the human person and trying to do some of that. Uh, in terms of, um, I mean, what percentage of, of, of that kind of work you say goes on at the hospital? That you say, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a smallish it's amount. It's a relatively small percentage. That's, that's probably true, but probably some of the more important. You know, in, in medical care, many times we, because we haven't raised, uh, faced some of those decisions, we, 
we can be very invasive and do so many procedures that don't need to be done on, on people yeah. at the end of life when somebody wants to hold on and do everything, but it can be so much sweeter and so much, yeah. so much better for that person, for the individual, if we do it well. But it's, you're right, relatively small percentage of what we do in hospitals, I would say. Yeah, but it's interesting that you bring that up because again, you give the people the right to determine what they want done. And some people are gonna go, I want everything Thank done, God. I want to do everything, everything you can. can. Hang and, hang yeah. and, then, and that's okay, that's again their choice. And I know you support that choice mm -hmm. when that choice is made and spelled out. But for so many others, yeah. I agree, it's in that moment of, of saying, well, you know, I'm coming to the end here. What is that all about? And, 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 you know, and so really in so many instances, it's a kind of a help me to live uh, until uh, the time comes for me to die. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I always, I always tease people. I'm just like, if you look on the bottom of your feet, you're not gonna see an expiration date. Yeah. <laughs> you're not gonna see anything there that's gonna tell you exactly what's gonna happen. So the real key is, is how do I help you to live as well as you can up until the moment when it's time for you to go to the other yeah. side. Yeah. You know, how do we do some of that? Yeah. So we're here uh, having this conversation with uh, Gary Pulsifer, who is uh, stake president at, uh, uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and Randy Garris, who is a longtime pastor here in the Joplin area, and right now at Ozark Christian College, uh, teaching people how to be ministers. It's a good thing. Uh, and we are here in terms of uh, having this conversation about end-of-life issues. We'll be right back after this Mercy Minute. I'm Angie Separita with Mercy Hospital. I'm here today with Dr. Danny Liu. He's a bariatric surgeon with Mercy, correct? Yes. And can you tell me what does that mean? Bariatric surgery is also known as weight loss surgery. And at our bariatric uh, surgery center, we focus on taking a multidisciplinary approach to fighting obesity. And that includes behavioral modification, lifestyle changes, and dietary counseling. And combined with surgical intervention, this usually leads to a very long-term and durable, successful weight loss. Uh, at our center, we also offer a full complement of surgical options, including laparoscopic room wide gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, and the lap band. And, and we tailor these uh, individual, to the individual needs. So it's not just uh, something that people just dive into. You actually work with them over the long course. Yes, that's correct. Uh, it is our aim to provide a safe, proven, and effective uh, option for those patients that are, have morbid obesity who have struggled for too long on their own. Very good. If you want to find out more, visit mercy.net. Hi, I'm Father Jay Friedel. Welcome back to Faith in Our Hometown. Uh, this weekend, we've been discussing the issues around the end of life. The fact that all of us age, uh, the fact that some of us get sick, uh, the fact that all of us eventually die. We've been talking with uh, Randy Garris, a local pastor, uh, and now currently at Ozark Christian College, and with uh, Gary Pulsifer, who's, who is the uh, COO of uh, Mercy Joplin, and also the stake president for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, we've been talking about this as people of faith. We've been talking about what we do for our own and some of the things that we need to do to help people to live holistically, uh, to take care of things of body and mind and spirit. And we were certainly in conclusion about the fact that uh, when it comes to the end of life, all those things suddenly start converging together in ways that really, really do matter. So we need to be able to have the conversations with each other. We need to be able to have those conversations with our loved ones. We need to be able to uh, Make sure that we've got advanced directives in place so that our wishes and needs, especially of our community members, are in place. And we also need to make sure that we're taking care of them as best that we can as they go through life, and especially as they approach the end of life. Because indeed, uh, it does matter how we help people to live until the time that they die. Uh, until the next time, uh, we will see you back here uh, at Faith in Our Hometown. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Thanks for watching. Faith in Our Hometown can be seen every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. here on KSN. Brought to you as a community service by Mercy Hospital Joplin.